Okay, uh, let's begin, and we're going to look at uh, books five and six today. I did, before we do that, wanted to just say a few words about the conclusion of book four, just a few comments in part because they'll set up what we're going to see in book six. Um, and I believe we left off last class with um, the uh, first encounter of, of Adam and Eve and her uh, rather comical um, first viewing of Adam. He was pretty happy with her. She, on the other hand, ran away until he called out to her and then she yielded to him. And I wanted to pick up with Satan's response to that because he's, he's seeing the whole thing. And uh, rather interesting, we saw the first time that he uh, viewed paradise and so forth, he was filled with envy and we're told by Milton that um, even though in the midst of, of uh, paradise that he could only uh, experience hell, in fact, uh, it was all the more hellish for experiencing something that was not designed for him and from which he could obtain no benefit other than to envy it further. But in response to that line 505 of book 4, Milton writes Satan's, uh, to Satan, Sight hateful, sight tormenting, thus these two imparadised in one another's arms, the happier Eden shall enjoy their fill of bliss on bliss, while I to hell am thrust, where neither joy nor love but fierce desire among our other torments, not the least, still unfulfilled with pain of longing pines. So the two are imparadised in one another's arms. There's a, this happens throughout Milton's uh, Paradise Lost, this um, different reflections on types of hell. There's, there's a, a, a physical hell, the geographical place. There's the hell in the sense of psychological torment, which accompanies him irrespective of where he is in terms of physical location. And then there's the, the spiritual despair, which is, which is a hell being absented from the presence of God in terms of a personal relationship. All three are there, and Milton plays on those all the time. Uh, yesterday, in my Lewis and Tolkien class, we talked about how in uh, ancient languages, words often have multiple, multiple resonances, like spiritus in Latin, and, and ruach in Hebrew can mean a breath and a wind, um, the breath of life, but just a wind as well. And, um, and of course, also the, the, the breath that goes into uh, humanity as well. There are various resonances, both physical and spiritual and theological. And uh, Milton, uh, Milton's use of language reflects that. So he, when he uses Latinate words, often they have multiple um, allusions. And we should not, um, we who are used to, uh, I would say, thinner uses of language need to recover some of the, the thickness of Milton's diction there. But so that's Milton's response immediately. He sees them imparadised in one another's arms, whereas, of course, he has he is has hell within him so all the worse they have one another they actually can acknowledge another being and love another being and that's because they are different they don't only regard themselves whereas satan is self-regarding by the way uh, martin luther when he was describing sin in the uh, epistle to romans uh, described it as uh, being curved in upon oneself in say corvatus so self-regarding, navel-gazing, regarding oneself as uh, the whole cosmos, rather than looking to God, looking to oneself. The postulate of autonomy and the Enlightenment is a great uh, manifestation of that. But sin itself is look, pridefully looking to ourselves and the benefit we and the goodness we see within ourselves, just like in the myth of Narcissus, as opposed to looking to God in whom all our uh, delight is uh, found and sustained and enjoyed. And Satan, of course, having rejected God out of pride, we're about to find out, uh, have that recounted to us in Book 5, uh, now can enjoy nothing 
as a consequence. Whereas Adam and Eve, and I talked about the sexual differentiation, and I, I, my classes are falling together quite neatly now. It, 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 I was reflecting on the significance of the sexual differences between Adam and Eve uh, in terms of the physical differentiation, which is the only visible sign of the of the the true distinctiveness of human beings. You can have different color hair, you can have no hair. Uh, you can have different color skin. You can have different shapes and sizes, but the one thing that's clearly and truly different between the two sexes is precisely that. So it's a sign that they're distinct, uh, unique, and they are persons. Are they so distinct that one is categorically different than in one another? No. Not at all. They both remain persons, and yet they're clearly distinct and cannot be confused or seen as the same. And thereby, because they are distinct, um, you can love that person as a free, as, not as a matter of compulsion. This person's not an extension of yourself. You're not really loving yourself. When you're loving another person, you're loving someone freely who is very different from you. And... Uh, and, 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 it's, and it's right and fitting that it be so. Now this is a reflection of the Trinity I talked about, um, where God is, is one and yet also three person, and the three persons relate to one another through love, which is freely offered. And Adam and Eve's love will also be freely offered, and I say this because we've seen throughout Paradise Lost, Milton talks about sinful rebellion and, and Satan speaks of it in terms of liberation, but we find that, in, in fact, that first of all, as I just said, it's all self-regarding. And secondly, there's no freedom in it. It's all, it's slavery to, to uh, follow sin and to rebel against God is to be enslaved and to experience no freedom and, to, and, and it only operates in accordance with coercion, furthermore. So Milton's very clear on this and, and, and the significance of, of freedom to love. And, and it, it uh, is the marker of God's created universe as well that the beings that were made in his image, and all spiritual beings for that matter, must freely love. And they must have the choice to do so. Hence the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They can choose to eat of that. It's a genuine choice. And we will know that it's a genuine choice by the fact that they actually lose their freedom. <clears throat> so Satan arrives, see, sees this and he is tormented by it because, of course, he ha there's no access for him to this freedom or this love. And he, uh, at one time, uh, on the one hand, despises it and on the other hand, longs for it. But uh, I want to conclude book four with just a very brief discussion of uh, the introduction of Uriel, who uh, spots um, the uh, Satan reveals himself in his envy, and Uriel, having let him go by, or rather told him where paradise was, now spots him and sends a few uh, lesser angels to uh, grab hold of Satan and throw him out out of the garden and uh, in line 800 we'll come to this encounter um, we, we see Satan in the guise of a, a, or he's squatting by the ear of Eve whispering into her, her ear and what he's whispering is the is a sort of temptation that perhaps she ought to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But when they accost him, they found him, line 799, here, him here they found squat like a toad, close at the ear of Eve, assaying by his devilish art to reach the organs of her fancy, her imagination. Remember in Paralandra, if you're doing that class with me, uh, same thing is happening there, trying to get her to imagine a greater good than the one that she already possesses. So she's going to sin not by 
doing a bad thing, but do it by thinking that she's going to achieve something better. So a, say, a, a saying by his devilish heart to reach the organs of her fancy and with them forge illusions as he list, phantasms and dreams, or if inspiring venom, he might taint the animal spirits that from pure blood arise like gentle breaths from rivers pure. That's what he seeks to do. And they touch him with their spears, the angels who have accosted him, and when they do, fascinating uh, use of uh, simile here, 8.14, they touch him, and as when a spark lights on a heap of nitrous powder, laid fit for the ton, some magazine to store against a rumored war, the smutty grain with sudden blaze diffused inflames the air. So they touch the toad, and he explodes like gunpowder. And then he, of course, explodes with rage. So started up in his own shape, the fiend back stepped those two fair angels half amazed so sudden to behold the grisly king yet thus unmoved with fear accost him soon and and this is almost again this is comic as well which of those rebel spirits adjudged to hell comest thou escape thy prison and transform why satst thou like an enemy in wait here watching at the head of these that sleep Know ye not then, said Satan, filled with scorn, know ye not me? Ye knew me once, no mate for you, there sitting where ye durst not soar. They can't even recognize him. The proud Satan is now an unrecognizable, first of he was a toad, but even when he's now exploded into his uh, real appearance, he, he's unrecognizable as the creature that fell from heaven. They know he's a fallen angel, but they have no idea who he is. Boy, this damages his pride like little else. At any rate, they, there's a dialogue here and a threat of conflict. And the conflict would, in fact, create uh, a terrible consequences in paradise. So 990. So they back and forth. There are lots of speeches threatening, uh, you know, I'm going to what I'm going to do to you and you have no power to do such and back and forth and, and, a, and a physical conflict is about to ensue and Milton concludes the chapter 990 now dreadful deeds might have ensued nor only paradise in this commotion but the starry cope of heaven perhaps of all the elements at least had gone to wreck disturbed and torn with violence of this conflict had not soon the eternal to prevent such horrid fray, hung forth in heaven his golden scales, yet seen betwixt Astria and Scorpion and the Scorpion sign. Therein all things created first he weighed, wherein rather, the pendulous round earth with balanced air and counterpoise now ponders all events, battles and realms. In these he puts two weights, the sequel each of parting and of fight. The latter quick up flew and kicked the beam. which Gabriel spying thus bespake the fiend, Satan, I know thy strength, and thou knowest mine, neither of our own, but given both of us achieve our strength from God. Still, this is an interesting thing. So Satan's claim of autonomy is not remotely true. The angel speaks truthfully to him. You have no power at all. You know you get all your power from God. He hasn't deprived you of it yet. You'll do that to yourself by continual rebellion. But as yet, what folly then to boast what arms can do, since thine no more than heaven permits, nor mine, though doubled now to trample thee as mire. In other words, in a fight, if we had such a fight, I would crush you. But both of us get our strength from heaven. For proof, however, look up. And read thy lot in yon celestial sign, where thou art weighed and shown how light, how weak, if thou resist. The fiend looked up and knew his mounted scale aloft, nor more, but fled murmuring, and with him fled the shades of night. So he, he scampered away with his tail between his legs. The scales were held aloft. Again, the uh, uh, classical uh, trope here, jo uh, Jupiter or Jove 
or Zeus will hold up the scales in heaven in which the fates are in the balance and he'll read the scales in, in accordance with whatever fate has decreed, then that will happen. Now note here, there's no reference to fate because in, in the uh, um, pagan understanding, the fates, the gods are subject to the fates. They can't change them. Here it's the, the motif of the scales is used, but really it's God's will, his providential will. He's not constrained by anything that he has to do. Remember, he's a free being. There is no compulsion to God. God's not compelled by anything, including our choices. The modern idea that God is waiting around to see what uh, creatures will do and then he's reacting to it is absurd. It's totally impossible. It makes God no longer God. <coughs> At any rate, that's how the uh, passage concludes. And so he leaves, and the reason I say that is in book five, uh, Eve recounts her dream to Adam, which is sort of a nightmare. And from that, uh, the fifth book will unfold. So Adam, Eve relates to Adam her troublesome dream, and he doesn't like it one bit. And he comforts her and sang a hymn and God, obviously already foreseeing their fall, but to render himself uh, inexcusable, that is to, I'm just reading from the argument here, render himself inexcusable, thereby uh, defending his own goodness, sends Raphael to warn him. He gets a warning about the, the nature of the foe that will be in, uh, in, in their midst. So, 2.24, let me pick it up there first, book 5, 2.24. God charges Raphael, Raphael, said he, thou hearest what stir on earth Satan from hell scaped through the darksome gulf hath raised in paradise. And how disturbed this night the human pair, how he designs in them at once to ruin all mankind. Go, therefore, half this day as friend with friend. Converse with Adam. He's been given a half day, by the way. Got to get back after that. You got half a day. Go down. Converse with Adam. In what bower or shade thou finds him from the heat of noon retired to respite his day labor with repast or with repose and such discourse bring on as may advise him of his happy state, happiness in his power left free to will, left to his own free will. His will, though free, yet mutable. It can change. Whence warn him to beware, he swerved not to secure. Tell him withal his danger, and from whom, what enemy had late fallen himself from heaven, is plotting now the fall of others from like state of bliss. By violence, no, for that shall be withstood, but by deceit and lies. This let him know lest willfully transgressing, he pretend surprisal, unadmonished, unforewarned. So there's gonna be no excuses. Now note here, Milton goes beyond the scriptural account. There's no such, uh, at least in, in the Bible, there's no such um, account related to us. Uh, Milton is adding this to justify God Is he, let's just leave it at that. Just note, he is adding to the Genesis account. Uh, whenever you add to an account, one has to question what's the effect of the addition. Does it help the narrative? Does it hinder it? What it because, and there can also be unintended consequences to it. Uh, another one we'll see in book nine is that he separates Adam and Eve, which I think if you read book, the third book in Genesis, it makes it pretty clear that the two are together when Satan is, or the, the serpent is tempting them both. But Adam's just sitting there like a stick or a stone while Eve is being spoken to. Very strange, it's hard to really understand why he's standing there 
the serpent is speaking to Eve and Adam's not saying anything or doing anything. And then after she takes the fruit and eats it, then he does. All without commentary from the author. It's just, this happens. But uh, Milton uh, expands hugely on that, separates the two, etc. And And whenever you, one does that, there are obviously, uh, first of all, questions will rise. Why would you dare do such a thing if you purport to present the account of things, how they actually happened, etc.? If this is supposed to be a sort of a true history, why would you do this and what are the consequences of that separation? At any rate, but the father uh, charges Raphael to go down to Adam and tell him so that there is no, there can be no excuses. If he should fall, he did so uh, with, with uh, total awareness of what threat there was. Now, I'll, I'll skip over that. Um, uh, that is the discussion between Adam and Eve there that uh, transpires at the beginning of five. Uh, and uh, there are, uh, Ad so Raphael first speaks to Adam, and I'll, I'll, uh, be, I'll pick it up there. So Adam bows down, 358. Uh, Near his presence, Adam, though not awed, yet with submiss approach and reverence meek, as to his superior nature, bowing low, thus said, native of heaven. So Adam first addresses him, uh, that is Raphael. And then Raphael responds, 372, Adam, I therefore came, nor art thou such created or such place hast here to dwell as may, oft, uh, as may not oft invite those spirits of heaven to visit thee. Lead on then where thy bower or shade. So show me where to go. And then as he goes there, he uh, speaks of um, Eve, 379. But Eve undecked, save with herself more lovely fair than wood nymph, or the fairest goddess feigned of three that in Mount Ida naked strove, stood to entertain her guest from heaven. No veil she needed, virtue proof. No thought infirm altered her cheek. So Eve is naked. And, and yet is beautifully clad as such and is not ashamed. On whom the angel, and this is, I think I like this, on whom the angel hail bestowed, the holy salutation used long after to bless Mary, second Eve. Hail, mother of mankind, whose fruitful womb shall fill the world more numerous with thy sons than with these various fruits the trees of God have heaped this table, raised of grassy turf, their table was, and mossy seats had round, and on her, her ample square from side to side, all autumn piled. So the harvest, isn't that a wonderful uh, synecdoche there? The all autumn was piled on the table, all the harvest. Though spring and, and autumn here danced hand in hand, there are no seasons as such. A wild discourse they hold, no fear lest dinner cooled, when thus, be, because it's not heated, when thus, uh, thus began our author, heavenly stranger, pleased to taste these bounties, which our nourisher from whom all perfect good unmeasured out descends, to us for food and for delight hath caused the earth to yield, unsavory food perhaps to spiritual natures, only this I know that one celestial father gives to all. And then so there's a discussion of, oh, you're a spiritual being, you're eating food, what's with that? And then there's a discussion about angels and what they eat and all that sort of stuff. We'll skip over angelic food. Uh, not that it's not interesting, but it would distract us from that. Let me pick it up at 461. Adam. Inhabitant with God, now know I well thy favor in this honor done to man, under whose lowly roof thou hast vouchsafed to enter, and these earthly fruits to taste, food not of angels, yet accepted so, 
as that more willingly thou couldst not seem at heaven's high feast to have fed. Yet what compare? To whom the winged hierarch replied, O Adam, one Almighty is, from whom all things proceed, and up to him return, if not depraved from good, created all such to perfection, one first matter all, endued with various forms, various degrees of substance, and in things that live, of life, but more refined, more spirituous and pure, as nearer to him placed, or nearer tending, each in their several active sp spheres assigned, till body up to spirit work, in bounds proportioned to each kind. So there is a hierarchy, and the hierarchy is a spiritual hierarchy. So from the root, which is naughty and tough, springs lighter the green stalk. From thence the leaves, more airy, last the bright consummate flower, spirits odorous breathes. So even the natural world tends to spiritual. The lightest things are at the top and the most beautiful things at the top. So we can see natural pictures of the order of nature, the great chain of being, if you will. And the most beautiful things are above, are, are, are airy and spiritual and lofty. Flowers and their fruit, man's nourishment, by gradual scale sublime to vital spirits aspire, to animal, to intellectual, give both life and sense, fancy and understanding, whence the soul reason receives, and reason is her being, discursive or intuitive. Discourse is oftest yours, that is human beings, the latter, that is intuition, most is ours, angels, angels intuit. And now I, I want to look at uh, an interesting uh, little discussion here about what might become of mankind, because remember, God has placed them in Eden, but he's given the mandate to uh, be fruitful and multiply and to bring the earth under their dominion, to make what is already good better, and that includes themselves, by the way. At least Milton seems to think so. They were already good. God has given them the mandate to make things even better. They have to work. And the labor is not only in developing the world outside of them, but developing themselves, cultivating their own spirits through devotion to God. And, at any rate, and from these corporal, corporal nutriments, for, uh, 496, Perhaps your bodies may at last turn all to spirit. Note that the angel is speculating. May, improved by tract of time and winged ascend ethereal as we, or may at choice here or in heavenly paradises dwell. Note that in the uh, new creation, it's a new heaven and a new earth. Both, where would you prefer to reside? So I think Mil Milton's sp clearly speculating, but he's speculating on the basis of what's revealed in Scripture. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. You may have a choice, here or in heavenly paradises dwell. If ye be found obedient, if, and retain unalterably firm his love entire whose progeny you are. Meanwhile, enjoy your fill, what happiness this happy state can comprehend incapable of more. To whom the patriarch of mankind replied, O favorable spirit, propitious guest, well hast thou taught the way that might direct our knowledge. So knowledge could be used to make man a spiritual being. Like gods. It's almost what uh, in the Eastern Orthodox tradition they call theosis. Right? It's very interesting. That might have been. Again, he's speculating somewhat, the angel. But it's a it's not it's not groundless speculation. And the scale of nature set from centers to circumference, wherein in contemplation of created things, by steps we may ascend to God. Says Adam. But say, what meant that caution joined? If ye be found obedient, 
Can we want obedience then to him or possibly his love desert who formed us from the dust and placed us here full to the utmost measure of what bliss human desires can seek or apprehend? It's unthinkable that they not obey. What a crazy thought. Why on earth do you raise this? To whom the angel, son of heaven and earth, note that he's son of both. He's made of the earth. But of course, he's made in God's image and God's in heaven. The prayer is, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's a connection there. We can't rise to heaven on our own, and certainly after sin, and possibly so, but through obedience, become more heavenly. At any rate, attend. What that thou art happy, O to God, that thou continuest such, O to thyself. That is, to thy obedience therein stand this was that caution given thee be advised god made thee perfect not immutable and good he made thee but to persevere he left in thy power ordain thy will by nature free not over overruled by fate inextricable or strict necessity our voluntary service he requires not our necessitated such with him finds no acceptance nor can find for how can hearts not free be tried whether they serve willing or no who will but what they must by destiny and can no other choose so the clear implication is that worship love is impossible without freedom And freedom is demonstrated through obedience. And the only way you can demonstrate obedience is if there's a possibility of disobedience. But that's with you. You've been made so, but now it's up to you. Your choice. Repeated throughout Paradise Lost. In case we forget. <clears throat> Myself and all the angelic hosts that stand in sight of God and throne, our happy state hold as you yours, while our obedience holds. On other surety, none. And then these famous lines, freely we serve, because we freely love, as in our will. To love or not, in this we stand or fall, and some are fallen. To disobedience fallen, and so from heaven to deepest hell. Oh, fall from what high state of bliss into what woe. So note again, the, uh, the disobedience is to God and there's, a, there's an immediate consequence in terms of distancing from God. It has all the other consequences of, of hell, the torment, the non-being, the privation of God's being, the twisting from love to hate all the, the move from freedom to slavery and coercion the treating of others as objects rather than as other beings a total reversal a total corruption but of obedience and freedom and the marriage of the two and the unity of two and of the necessity of, of both uh, to in, in Christian practice although it's not yet called Christian practice, is, is stated by Milton all over the place. So I think it's just a fascinating little account. So then the question Adam asks, thy words attentive and with more delighted ear and divine instructor I have heard than when cher cherubic songs by night from neighboring hills aerial music send, nor knew I not to be both will, will and deed created free. Yet, that we never shall forget to love our maker and obey him whose command single is yet so just, my constant thoughts assured me and, and still assure. Though what thou tellest hath passed in heaven, some doubt within me move. But more desire to hear, if thou consent, the full relation, which must needs be strange, worthy of sacred silence to be heard, and we have yet large day, for scarce the sun hath finished half his journey, and, and scarce begins his other half in the great zone of heaven. So we got a whole day now. Tell me. 
Thus Adam made request, and Raphael, after short pause assenting, thus began. And now we get the account of Satan's rebellion. And it will expand to the account of the war in heaven that breaks out. But it's told in a, um, as a, as a, a backflash, as it were. <clears throat> High matter thou enjoins me, O prime of men, sad task and hard, for how shall I relate to human sense the invisible exploits of warring spirits? How without remorse, the ruin of so many glorious ones, and perfect while they stood, how, last, unfold the secrets of another world, perhaps not lawful to reveal? Uh, the angel expresses Milton's own thoughts here, I think. Perhaps not lawful to reveal it. Well, he's done it anyway. I mean, again, there's precedent for it in Revelation 12. But now he's amplifying that in a way that's obviously well beyond anything written. Yet for thy good, this is dispensed. And what surmounts the reach of human sense, I shall delineate so, by likening spiritual to corporal forms. So he, and we would call this accommodationist language. So now he's going to he's going to relay to Adam in terms that he can understand what happened in heaven. And so we, and this is way, Milton's way of recounting something, and yet suggesting that uh, he can't be held too strictly for it. Because he's speculating in the same way that Dante, when he comes to describe uh, the Paradiso, is doing the exact same thing. It's like a dream, and he can't even describe what it was like. In this case, the angel is using uh, corporal forms to describe spiritual matters. <laughs> so he goes on. So how does this then happen? Uh, 603. There's an act in heaven. God the Father speaks. Here, all ye angels... Line 600, progeny of light, thrones, dominations, princedoms, virtues, powers, hear my decree, which unrevoked shall stand. This day I have begot whom I declare my only son. Psalm 2. And on this holy hill him have anointed, whom ye now behold at my right hand. Your head I him appoint and by myself have sworn to him, shall bow all knees in heaven, and shall confess him Lord. Under his great vice-regent reign, vice-gerent reign, abide, united as one individual soul, forever happy. Him who disobeys me, disobeys, breaks union, and that day cast out from God in blessed vision, falls into utter darkness, deep engulfed, his place ordained without redemption, without end. Now, so in other words, even the spirits in heaven have had fair warning about what will happen. So spake the omnipotent, and with his words all seemed well pleased. All seemed, but were not all. That day, as other solemn days, they spent in song and dance about the sacred hill, mystical dance. which yonder starry sphere of planets and of fixed in all her wheels resembles nearest, mazes intricate, eccentric, intervolved, yet regular than most, when most irregular they seem. And in their motions harmony divine so smooths her charming tones that God's own ear listens delighted. Okay, so this is Neoplatonic reflections here, by the way, on the, the astrological Portions between the planets and and, and the, this be speaking of a resonance between the soul and planets and so it's the um, a, a amplification of what I talked about Boethius tractate on music the musica mundana and the musica humana so there's a, a proportion there and a resonance and the concord that reigns in heaven echoes with the concord in the human breast as sort of a music. 
By the way, as late as Johannes Kepler, astronomers thought in terms of musical intervals, that is, uh, tones between the uh, planets. It was a musical tone that separated them. It could be measured in that fashion. And they did so on the basis of what they could observe through the musica uh, instrumenta, through their own earthly music. Right? We can hear. This is, this is A, this is B, this is C, this is D, and so on. We can hear and very clearly, and when we play them in this, there's a harmony. And it's mathematically precise, so the mathematician, the, the Pythagoreans, will talk about the significance of number, number for them being the primal entity in all of, all of uh, the created order. Well, they don't talk about the created order, but in everything that is, number is there. So music. <coughs> so then he goes on, and I will pick it up to then uh, Satan's response. So this goes on, and there is, by living streams, 653, among the trees of life, pavilions numberless, and sudden reared, celestial tabernacles, where they slept fanned with cool winds, save those who in their course melodious hymns about the sovereign throne alternate all night long. And then there's the but. But not so waked Satan. So call him now. His former name is heard no more in heaven. He of the first, if not the first archangel, great in power, in favor and preeminence, yet fraught with envy against the Son of God. That day honored by his great father and proclaimed Messiah, king anointed, could not bear through pride that sight and thought himself impaired. There you go. That's why. That's where it all comes from. Satan's envious reception of the son's anointing by the father. That's the context. He thought himself impaired because he had pretensions to godhood. By the way, wanting to be like God is not a sin. Wanting to be God is. <laughs> and that's what he wanted in his thoughts deep mouths thence conceiving and disdain. Soon as midnight brought on the dusky hour friendliest to sleep in silence, he resolved with all his legions to dislodge and leave unworshipped, unobeyed the throne supreme, contemptuous, and his next subordinate awakening thus to him in secret spake. Sleep'st thou, companion dear, what sleep can close thy eyelids? And rememberest what decree of yesterday so late hath passed the lips of heaven's almighty? Thou to me thy thoughts wast wont, I mine to thee was wont to impart. Both waking we were one. How then can now thy sleep descent? New laws thou seest imposed, new laws from him who reigns. New minds may raise in us who serve, new counsels to debate what doubtful may ensue. More in this place to, to utter is not safe. Assemble thou of all those myriads which we lead the chief. Tell them that by command, ere yet dim night, her shadowy cloud withdraws, I am to haste, and all who under me their banners wave, homeward with flying march where we possess the quarters of the north, there to prepare fit entertainment to receive our king, the great Messiah in his new commands, who speedily through all the hierarchies intends to pass triumphant and give laws. So spake the false archangel and infused bad influence into the unwary breast of his associate. So he deceives him. We're going to receive him there. How are we going to receive him? We're going to receive him there with rebellion. We'll withdraw to the, withdraw to the north, whatever the north means in heaven. <coughs> and there we'll give him a reception he won't soon forget. So they will go at night in the north, and there will be a war between two armies 
with two similar intent with similar intentions in three ways. One, they want to appoint a king in heaven. One's going to be a crowned Messiah. That's God's intention. Satan has other intentions. Let's let's annoy a different king. Him, of course. Secondly, uh, they have in common that all the power that they have comes from God, which is why his idea is ridiculous from the outset. But they share this in common. So the war in heaven is a funny old war because all of their strength and power derives from God. And not, even when they rebel against him, it still derives from God because God's the source of all power. It doesn't change. Thirdly, they're all immortal. So if they're all immortal, then why fight? It's a futile judgment. I mean, you can't kill your enemies. So, so there's a war in heaven. Now, remember, Milton's just said, I'm going to account, recount to your uh, earthly, physical ears, sp spiritual matters, and try and present it in ways that you can understand. But obviously, th it doesn't make a lot of sense, this war in heaven. Although, again, it's recounted in Revelation 12. Uh, Milton, by the way, does not like epic battles. So he's writing an epic, but there are no accounts like that in the Iliad or in the Aeneid where there are huge wars going on. And they go on for books and books and books. He does not like them. He'll make that clear in Book 9 as well, actually. He's not, these are not battles of physical beings. They're spiritual battles. So he moves quickly from the epic narrative to really the mock epic. So within the epic itself there are things that mock everything that is epic namely things like battles and so forth so at first there is something in book five of a parody of homer's iliad or the second six books of the aeneid similar uh, there's a battle between two immortals the two immortal armies it's even more ridiculous than the battle between hector and Achilles. Achilles can't be slain by a sword, so what sort of battle is that? It's a stupid battle. Nonetheless, it transpires. This is even more ridiculous, because these are both immortal, and both derive their power from the same source, not from opposite sources, let alone their own power. Secondly, uh, what will ensue, and it will be picked up in Book 6, is a three-day battle. And the three-day battle, this is important to note, uh, will reflect the death of Christ, the descent of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ. Those things will be amplified in the three days battle in heaven. In this battle, the two sides will use artillery. 